The following KQED production was produced in high definition. Premature birth is on the rise in the U.S. Each year, about one in eight live births are premature. And while the survival rate for preemies has increased, these babies often have long-term physical damage, which can have huge emotional impacts on the families involved. And prematurity is expensive. The estimated financial hit to the U.S. economy is more than $26 billion a year. So when Quest decided to investigate, I jumped at the chance to cover the story. After all, I'm 28 weeks pregnant, with twins. And because I have multiples, I'm considered a high risk for preterm labor, which could result in my babies being born prematurely. I began my research by going to talk with Dr. Elliot Main at California Pacific Medical Center in San Francisco, which is considered one of the top maternity hospitals in the country. I wanted to get a sense of what a woman facing preterm labor might have in store. Like somebody who's gone through their pregnancy like I have, considering it's a high-risk multiple birth mm-hmm. pregnancy, and everything's gone great up to 28 weeks, I mean, is it unlikely that it would just turn at this point? Well, the farther you go, the less likely there are going to be problems, very clearly. But the twins fall into two categories. Some people who just cruise through the pregnancy and don't turn a hair and look back on the experiences, what was the big deal? But there are more twins that end up in and out of the hospital, uh, on bed rest, uh, on medications, and it's a piece of work. Mm -hmm. But you don't know at the beginning who's going to fall into which category. Bed rest, medication, it sounded pretty daunting, and not just for a mother of multiples like me. Even a mother delivering a single baby is at higher risk these days. This issue of preterm birth is a tragic crisis in our country. Prematurity has increased by 30% since 1981. And in half the cases, we don't know why preterm birth occurs. Prematurity is one of the major health issues in America today. It causes one third of all the deaths of children in the United States. Uh, And it is a very large contributor to the costs. My next stop was to visit Dr. Yao Sun, director of neonatal clinical programs at UCSF Children's Hospital in San Francisco, where they have one of the top educational research and clinical programs for preemies in the U.S. Prematurity is defined as being less than 37 weeks. 23 or 24 weeks is what we call the, um, the edge of viability. That is the age where even if we do absolutely everything that we can do, um, many babies will not survive. Here at UCSF, we would probably say that at around uh, 23 to 24 weeks is where you would have about a 50% survival. To prevent the complications associated with such premature births, doctors do everything in their power to keep the babies in their mother's wombs as long as possible. You can feel like that little ridge is up here. This can mean significantly more hospital time, as was the case for Trin Miller and David Prince of San Francisco. It didn't really occur to me that anyone was in the hospital for weeks at a time um, during a pregnancy. And at some point in the first few days being here, I realized, oh my God, you know, I could potentially be here laying on my back like this for weeks just trying to keep these babies in. Okay. For Trin and David, there was no way to prevent premature delivery. Their twins were suffering from a complication that threatened one of the baby's lives. We just came to the point of realizing that one of the babies could die or we could be in a situation where we would be doing an emergency delivery where we were looking at the clock, relying on, you know, a few minutes to really get them out, and we just did not want to be in that situation. The Miller-Prince twins were delivered by cesarean section at 28 and a half weeks. They can expect to spend at least two months in the intensive care nursery. Yeah. They are 13 days old today. They were born on June 1st. 
and they're gaining weight, um, they're eating, I'm pumping breast milk for them, and they're getting that milk through a tube directly into their stomach, and they're tolerating it and wanting more, so that's good. It turns out the whole gestation and birth process is exquisitely calibrated. There's a reason babies are supposed to stay in the womb for 40 weeks. Different organs develop at different rates, and some need more time than others. Now, certain organ systems actually tend to develop earlier and, and are more capable of functioning earlier in the gestational period. So, um, for instance, a heart or the cardiac system actually develops quite early, and by you know, 12 weeks of gestational age is essentially fully formed. I mean, it continues to kind of develop in strength, um, but, but it works. Um, the lungs, in comparison, are, are nowhere even close to being fully formed at, at that age. Advancing technology has made it common for doctors to be able to keep babies alive that weigh less than two pounds. They're able to effectively deal with a lot of immediate survival issues, like a preemie's inability to eat, regulate body temperature, or breathe. But if the brain is not developed enough or damaged, it can have a much longer-term impact. Babies can often be on breathing machines and on other high-tech equipment where survival is really the major concern. And, and once those issues have subsided, then parents begin to, to focus um, on the long-term consequences of prematurity. And the brain is, is one of the organs that can have one of the most severe uh, long-term consequences for patient quality of life. Josephine Tooley was born at 28 weeks. Her mother, Sarah, had concern about Josephine's brain function, which led her to participate in a long-term study at UCSF Children's Hospital. Before she was born, I was able to have the shots of steroids to help improve her lung condition, and she's benefited so much from all the technology that they have here. Her father and I thought it would be a great opportunity to be part of that and hopefully help parents in the future. In the study, doctors are using a special incubator conceived by Dr. Jim Barkovich that allows for detailed magnetic resonance imaging scans for preemies. These MRIs can help to forecast potential brain damage. By using MRI, we found really subtle abnormalities within the premature baby's brains that no one had ever found before. And we find them in a percentage of babies that pretty well correlates with the percentage of, of those babies that turn out to have some sort of developmental disabilities. What we're trying to do now is look at the MRs and follow the babies to see if we can make specific predictions about outcome based on what we see on the MRI. How's Josephine's scan? Well, Josephine's scan looks really good because where we look for we look for injury in premature babies in the white matter, which is this dark area, and what we look for are areas of higher signal, and we don't see any of that here. So we would say that this scan doesn't sh doesn't show any signs of injury. As Josephine grows and gets stronger in the intensive care nursery. Sarah is learning a lot about adapting her behavior to care for her tiny daughter. And um, with preemies, you can't pat them or stroke them the way you would with a full term infant because their skin's a lot more sensitive and neurologically they're not as developed for that. And so it startles them and actually stresses them quite a bit. So you do what's called palming where you just put your hands, hi. Yeah. There is a definite two-edged sword to our success in the care of premature babies. One, we like to trumpet the ability to save babies, uh, but on the other hand, we are saving more babies that have long-term complications. Uh, and our society doesn't deal well with long-term complications, whether it's in the mental health field or in any other chronic disease field. Dr. Main and others are researching a number of possible factors that might lead to preterm labor. These include ethnicity, age of the mother, use of fertility treatments, socioeconomic status, and environmental factors. But to date, most of the research hasn't been conclusive. We wrapped up filming for this story two weeks ago, but here's where the plot thickens. 
I'm going to try with maybe A, B, and down and out. Five days ago, after some tests indicated that I might be going into preterm labor, my obstetrician admitted me to the hospital for further tests and monitoring. So all those sounds are the baby moving uh -huh. around. Huh? That harsh. Around. I'm now 31 weeks pregnant. And they're trying to go away from the sound. The sound's projecting into them, and they're trying to move away from it. So Because my cervix, the opening to my uterus, has shortened, and I'm having frequent contractions, I'm facing several weeks in the hospital on bed rest to try to keep the boys inside of me for as long as possible. Considering the situation I'm in right now, I'm very lucky to be here in the Bay Area. We have several of the top prenatal and neonatal treatment centers in the world. We have access to a broad range of community services and resources for high-risk pregnant moms. But the question remains, what can be done to slow the rate of preterm birth? The priority is research because we don't have the answers and so to prevent preterm labor we have to understand why it occurs. We are also putting our efforts into education. We want to educate women about how to recognize the signs and symptoms of preterm labor so that if they are in preterm labor they know they need to go to the hospital. I think that unfortunately we are still not at a state where we kind of know what we don't know. We're learning more and more and our capability to learn is increasing at an ever more rapid pace, but really there's a lot we don't know right now.